evening. It's good to see you all once again. We're now up here to worship. Appreciate the presence of each and every one of you here this night. Um, if you do not consider it robbery to spend time with God and His people as we continue this worship and study another portion of His Word. If you want to open your Bibles in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, it's going to be the source text of tonight's lesson, and we'll be there in just a moment. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, that's what we'll be starting at in just a moment. <clears throat> Excuse me. I remember my educational career vaguely. I do remember the last day of college, a little bit of irony had happened. In my university, we were required to take a capstone course, and our school's motto was let knowledge serve the city, because we were Portland State University, we're right there in metropolitan Portland, and that motto, on a side note, one of my professors said, if I became president of this university, I'd tear down that motto and get rid of it. Because our capstone class really had nothing to do with our degree, it was a glorified volunteer project that was outside the purview of your normal school hours, didn't care if you had a job to work or whatnot. But I remember on the last day of class, here was our assignment. Draw a picture of something you have learned in this class. Mind you, I'm paying several hundred dollars per credit hour to take this class. And there were snacks. So I, I thought it was kind of ironic that my first day of school in kindergarten, there were snacks, and I had crayons, and I drew a picture. And in college, I had snacks, and I drew a picture, except this time I was paying for it, and they let me use markers. In between was a whole bunch of busy work, I guess. My point in telling you this is, you know, in modern education, there's a whole bunch of different ways we have come up with the thing that is good at educating people. But really, at the end of the day, education really has not changed in the thousands of years that we as humans have been practicing it. And this is why the history department, my degree, was my safe haven because I had professors says, no, we are not going to co-teach, we are not going to group learn, we are going to lecture to you, you will take your midterm, you will take your final. That is how this thing works. Whether you agree with that or not, it was refreshing because I've had classes too where I got to grade myself. I paid money to grade myself, okay? And the sad thing is, sometimes we try and get cute with teaching Bible. We try and think of new ways to do it, find the right curriculum, do X, Y, Z thing, when really what God has given us to teach our children, to teach the lost and each other has not changed in the thousands of years that he has been given the command to teach the children or teach each other. His word and the message spoken to communicate what the word says. That's why in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 15, we read this statement about how do we grow to unity as a church? How do we grow to maturity as individuals? In the midst of this whole section, the apostle Paul writes, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ. How I grow as an individual, how we grow as a congregation, is by me practicing this principle here of, of the truth of God's word in love. In short, teach. And so tonight I want to focus more on a practical side of this because we, we understand the commands, right? Go and teach all the nations, Mark 16. Or go and make disciples. They're a type of learner. How do you make them? You've got to teach them. Jesus then the Matthew in verse 20 says, Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always in the end of the age. We get that, right? You can nod your head. We get that command. But we struggle with, well, how do I do that? Because it's difficult, right? Or it seems that way. To me, the most difficult Bible class I've ever taught, and it, gets, it doesn't get any easier each time I teach it, is teaching how to study the Bible. Because you have to end up dissecting your own approach and figure out how do you communicate that to somebody, right? I still love teaching that subject, by the way. But anyway, tonight, 
focus on a topical lesson on just some practical tips, some ideas of how do we teach. So let's define our terms. Really at its most basic level, you can look at any dictionary, no matter how far back it goes for English, to teach or teaching is simply to cause to know something. Immediately, there's a whole bunch of different approaches we could take to achieve that goal, right? I'm working, you know, I'm, I'm, this is a joke, a joke warning ahead. I could say to the elders, I, I deserve a bonus because with all the YouTube videos, I'm doing quadruple teaching and I don't even have to do all the speaking. <laughs> um, that's one way of doing it, right? Pre record material. Correspondence courses, example, living it, actually communicating something to someone. There's any different number of ways you can cause somebody else to know something, even by bad example, right? And Christianity at its core is a teaching religion. Um, in, in Mark's gospel, for example, you know, this is right when Jesus is beginning his ministry in Mark's account here, and it just says very plainly, in the fourth chapter in verse 1, and he began to teach again by the sea. We quoted earlier, Matthew 28, 19 through 20, there's the command, the Great Commission, right? Go and make disciples of all the nations. How do you do that? You go and you baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and you teach them to observe all that Jesus taught the apostles, and you have the blessing that Jesus will be with you in that endeavor. We get that, right? Every Christian is being involved in this effort. Acts 8 and verse 4, after the persecution arose against the church there in Jerusalem, what does the text say? That the disciples who were scattered abroad went about proclaiming the gospel. Notice how they did not have lesson outlines, curriculum. What they did have was the truth of what God had done for them in Christ Jesus. And they told people about that. I'm going to pause here real quick. Now, that definition up on the board, the cause to know something. I think sometimes, and myself included, we, we overcomplicate the teaching process. It is simply one person saying something to another person about a subject, right? That's the oldest way of teaching. We might call it lecturing or, or a dialogue or discourse. Um, it's conveying information and then responding to questions that might be asked of that said information to come to a better understanding. And I think we get intimidated, as I was, about the type of teaching I'm engaged in right now or in Bible class teaching or whatever it may be, but we teach all the time, right? You have a new co-worker at work and didn't quite get something on the train and said, hey, Dave, can you show me how to do this invoice? And you're just showing, simply showing them what the knowledge that you have and they don't have and they pick up on it. You know, we, we teach our children when they're, even before they can communicate on how to use utensils by miming how to use the spoon, right? We do this all the time. And teaching Bible is no less different. But every Christian is being involved in this in some way. Not exactly the same way, but in some way. Because one of the benchmarks of maturity, as we covered a couple weeks ago in Hebrews, was eventually we get to the point where we should be able to be Teachers. In Hebrews chapter 5, looking at the 11th verse, the Hebrew writer has just introduced this idea of Melchizedek, and he says here in verse 11, concerning him, that is Melchizedek, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. And you've come to need milk and not solid food. Excuse me, it should be 11 and 12 up there. What's the point? The Hebrew writer is saying, at this juncture in your Christian life, you should be teaching. It's the emphasis on the word ought. You ought to be teachers. You're at that position now. You've been Christians long enough. But he says the reality is you have neglected your own spiritual growth. And so instead of being teachers of the gospel, you have someone you have need for somebody to reteach you the first principles of the gospel. And the sad thing is, there are congregations that do exist where this is the reality. 
in Oregon, for example, most of my preacher training involved appointment preaching. And normally it was for congregations that their preacher was out of town. It's not that this con these congregations didn't have wise individuals. It's not that these congregations didn't have wise men. At least I think they did. But when the preacher's out, they had to call somebody else from out in to do the job. Um, really, that, that shouldn't be the case. Every congregation should have of its own members men who, are, who know the text well enough, women who know the text well enough to where they need a sub for Bible class. They can tap your shoulder. Preachers can be out of town or, Lord forbid, I wake up sick. Who can step in at the last minute? Who can step in if there needs to be a sub? Or I can't, or somebody can't make a personal Bible study. Who can fill in for them? Who can cover that? It has a lot to do with preparation, and we'll cover that in just a minute, but being prepared and having a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures is indispensable for the Christian. It's indispensable, and we all ought to be involved in that. And teaching fundamentally, teaching needs to have the right goal. If we have the wrong goal when we're trying to teach, we're going to get wrong results. Teaching, the goal in teaching, is not simply to make somebody like me. I don't want that. Because I'm full of faults and I don't always do everything right. The goal of teaching isn't simply knowledge either. Jesus rebuked the Pharisees because, you know, they, Jesus said there in, in John's account, I believe it is, says, you search the scriptures because you think in there there is life. It is these that testify about me. What's his point there? The Pharisees knew the scriptures really well, so they thought. They had a good knowledge, factual knowledge. But that factual knowledge did not lead to them having faith in Christ. They had all the facts. They weren't connecting the dots. So it's not just knowledge either. But since going back to Ephesians 4, the goal of teaching is transformative knowledge of God. Transformative knowledge of God. I could care less how many times you've read the Bible. And really, that shouldn't be a criterion for anything. Just how many times you've read through it. Um, I, don't, I don't care if a person can quote to me all the kings of Israel and Judah in succession and know all the drama and all the, the, the dumpster fire stuff about their families. I don't care if you can tell me who Methuselah's third cousin twice removed was. What I do care about is, are we taking what we're learning, planting it deep in our hearts, and are we living it? Is that what's happening? Because Bible Jeopardy, while fun, will not get you into heaven. Embodying the teaching of Christ will. Looking back in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 11, the Bible reads, there, let us be, oh, excuse me, see, when you get excited, and you look down, and it just says chapter 4, you find verse 11, and you're like, wow, that, that's pretty quick, not realizing I was still in Hebrews. Um, Ephesians 4, verse 11. And Christ gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the full knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. So we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up into all aspects into him who is the head, that is Christ, from whom the whole body, being joined and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the properly measured working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Notice what the apostle says there is, what, what is the goal? He starts off by saying, God has given these roles in the church. They're all teaching roles. 
Prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists. They're all teaching roles. And we still have the prophets today in the writings of the, of, of the Bible. But what are the goals of the teachers? It isn't simply knowledge impartation. It is equipping all believers for their specific work of ministry, their work of service, so the whole body may continue to grow into more like Christ. And this process continues until we all reach the statue that Jesus had himself to the mature manhood. Now, you and I both know that won't happen in this life. So this process is continuing. It's ongoing. But the goal is transformation into Jesus. And I, I'm harping on this point because I know I did not always get this. I know some of my goals in Bible class early on here and other places was not always the transformative knowledge of God and more love of the brethren. It was simply, I got to get through Romans 6 today. Or, they need to get these facts. Or my most hated acronym, students will be able to. That was big in education when I went through high school. Some of my math teachers had that written on the board and they stated the objective for the day. Dumb objective. There's no guarantee that your students are going to be able to do anything. I digress. But if I have the goal of clearly communicating what the text says so that we can clearly see the application of it, so the life can be transformed, that's really the goal of Bible teaching. And that should always be the goal. Because if we have this goal right, we're going to avoid some bad methodologies and bad teaching approaches. So, um, some ideas on here on how to teach well. I'm not going to tell you anything revelatory uh, about this, about teaching in general, but these are some points that I think need to be emphasized. And you read any book on Bible teaching, any book on teaching, to some degree, they will emphasize these points. Uh, the first is embody the teaching well. Looking over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, looking at verses 24 through 26. You know, we often go to 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus because, you know, elders got qualifications, deacons got qualifications. We'll waste a ton of ink talking about the elders' qualifications. We'll forget about the deacons. I'm being a little funny here. But there's also qualifications for preachers or those who would teach. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting verse 24. And the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may give them repentance, leading to the full knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. And Paul, at the beginning of the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Before I get up to teach, on whatever subject it may be, I need to make sure I am embodying the teaching of Christ well. Because the, the saying is true, more is caught than taught. That is true in parenting, that's true in teaching children. More is caught than taught. And so kids especially, they can smell a fake a mile away. If you're being inconsistent, hypocritical, kids especially. Adults, they have a good head on their shoulders they can. People can tell a fake a mile away. And a lot of damage can be done if we start teaching the Bible and it's very much uh, do as I say, not as I do approach. That will not do. We have to embody the teaching well. So if I'm going to teach on brotherly love, I better be sure I'm practicing brotherly love. If I'm going to be teaching on, say, discipline, I better make sure that if I'm a parent, my kids are a model of a godly discipline. Um, because I, I, it's on the board, but let's think back to James chapter 3. There's a reason why James says, let not many of you become teachers, lest you incur strict judgment. When you teach publicly, privately, you open up yourself for examination. 
You do. You teach on child discipline, and I don't know why I'm on this subject, but I'm just going to go with it. Same disclaimer always works. I'm single. I don't have kids. So, anyway, if you teach on child rearing and child discipline and your kids are obnoxious brats, you're probably, it doesn't matter if what you said was true. People are going to look at the inconsistency. This is why embodying the teaching is so important. If I talk about the value of youth and how, you know, Paul says in 2 Timothy, let no one look down on your youthfulness, and yet I'm not modeling what Paul said to Timothy about being an example of good conduct, of love, of, of genuine faith. No one's going to listen to me. Because my life is not matching my teaching. Know your audience. That's probably the second thing I would have to say about how to teach well, is know your audience. Not everyone is in the same place. And this is probably the hardest thing about teaching, in my opinion is the ability to read a room. The ability to read the person you're teaching. If you just look in the book of Acts, we're just going to survey a couple spots here. If you look at the preaching in the book of Acts, it, it, it all, it's all over the place. In that, the starting points, the argumentation, the way the argument's formulated, it's all custom to the audience. For example, in Acts 2, Looking at verses 14 through 16, we're dealing with a Jewish audience. And they have a question. This the sermon starts with the question, like, how can we understand everybody in, their, in our own language? And Peter says here in verse 14, uh, he raised his voice and declared to them, men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. For these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. I'm not going to read the whole sermon. But Peter sizes up his audience. They have a question. They've all been in town for Passover, which means they're Jewish. So my starting point is, I'm going to answer the question, I'm going to appeal to the Jewish scriptures. So that's why he quotes from Joel. You look over in chapter 8, in verse 29... In Acts chapter 8, verse 29, of the Ethiopian eunuch, we read here, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet, and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of Scripture which he was reading was this, As a sheep is led to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation his judgment is taken away. Who will recount his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you earnestly, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from this scripture, he proclaimed the good news about Jesus to him. Different audience, different starting point. Granted, the Holy Spirit was involved in arranging the appointment, but he starts off, well, what are you reading? What are you reading? Well, I'm reading Isaiah. And you might have heard, well, we were given the passage he's reading. It's a good passage it's from Isaiah 53. It's about the suffering servant. So he has some information, but Philip asked probably the most important question you can ask. Do you understand what you're reading? And that led to the opportunity to teach. He knew his audience. That was really effective, by the way. I, I knew of a congregation that set up a booth and they handed out Bibles. And the only, the only catch was you just had to leave your contact information and they would call you two weeks later. One time call, that was it. And all they asked, they asked two questions. One was, have you read your Bible? The one they gave them. And the answer was yes. What did you read? They asked three questions, excuse me. And they asked exactly what Philip asked the eunuch. Well, did you understand what you read, or do you have questions about it? That led to several Bible studies simply because they asked, well, did you understand what, or do you got questions about what you read? And really, a little side point here, and maybe I should put it as another point, asking questions 
of the person you're teaching is one of the most effective tools in teaching. I'd rather have somebody guide me through the thinking process so I can think my way through the answer rather than being spoon-fed. Because if I'm just given the answers, I actually haven't learned to think through anything. I really haven't learned to do the work. You know, this was the annoying thing, and my mom will admit this. My mom's one of those people when she just looks at a math problem, she just knows the answer. She just does. Which, if you're in high school or junior high where you're required to show your work, that's not really helpful. <laughs> she would say, well, I know the answer. I'm like, I have to show work or I don't get credit. Like, well, I can't help you there. The same is true in Bible study. How you get to the answer matters just as much as the answer. Because if you take shortcuts and you get the right answer, that's still bad for you because you've done what's called eisegesis, which is bad reading of the text. I remember a few times on, on Algebra 2, I did the math completely wrong and I got the right answer. I remember on the test, too, there was a question mark next to it and I got half a point because math is wrong, got the right answer, so you had to give me something. Uh, it's not good in Bible study. It's how you get there does matter. And so when you're teaching, explaining the process or your thought process or leading a person in this, this, this journey of, self, of discovery of the text is just as important but you're equipping them not just with the right answers, but with the tools so they can study on their own and come to a right understanding. In Acts 17 and verse 22, I just referenced it for sake of time. That's Paul on, on Mars Hill. Paul's sermon on Mars Hill is very interesting. Well, I feel a little good tonight, so I'm just going to say it. I, I think a lot of brethren would take issue with Paul's sermon on Mars Hill. And they would say it's not scriptural enough. Because Paul doesn't quote scripture in the Sermon on Mars Hill. Well, he quotes God's other book. He points out creation and how creation testifies to the maker. And he even quotes some pagan philosophers to prove his point. Why does he do that? He's dealing with philosophers who have no, little to no knowledge about the Hebrew Bible. They have little to no knowledge about God, but they do have knowledge about the natural world and reason. So that's where Paul starts there. Now, he gets to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He just takes a different route to get there, but he knew his audience, and he taught appropriately. Now, practically speaking, why, how is this of any use? I can have expectations or wants or desires that I think the class should be here. The people's Bible, Bible knowledge should be here. Oh, shoulda, coulda, woulda. That's not the reality in front of me. As a teacher, you have to deal with what's in front of you. And you may want to be able to have these high-level discussions up here. That's cool. Have those. But like the Hebrew writer, Hebrew writer doesn't say tough toenails, we're going to talk about Melchizedek, whether you're ready or not. He spends some time to prep them on it. Paul says multiple times, it is not a pain for me to write these things to you again. John, I believe it is, no, Peter, excuse me, Peter, towards the end of his life, he says, so long as I'm in this earthly tabernacle, I, will seem it, I, will, I deem it right and fitting for me to stir you up by way of reminder, even though you already know this. Peter deals with where people are at. Thirdly, prepare well. In Luke, the 14th chapter, in Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30. Now, I understand the context about discipleship, but I think there's another lesson we can, and principle we can pull from this section. Luke chapter 14, starting verse 28. For which one of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? Lest when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who observe it and begin to ridicule him, saying, this man began to build, was not able to finish. There's a lesson here. Sitting down and making the preparations. 
See, there's two errors we have to avoid against in Bible class. And one we're going to be very familiar with, Bible teaching, and that one might come as a surprise. There's the danger of under-preparation. This is evident. Reminds me of the old story that uh, there was a preacher one time, and uh, it seemed like every four or five weeks he'd get really emotional in the sermon. A, a point about Jesus' death would just, just hit him right in the heart. And he'd end the sermon. And this lady goes to visit another church, and she starts talking to the preacher about that. And the older preacher said, hmm, sounds like every four to five weeks your preacher's not prepared. Because oftentimes, we, re we resort to emotionalism when we're underprepared. We'll let the class talk more. And raising both hands on this, okay, this is not a pot, this is a little bit of pot calling kettle black here. There's a wealth of of mistakes in my teaching career on teaching Bible that I'm drawing from on this. Under preparation is a danger. Here's the other one that might come as a surprise to you. Over preparation. You can over prepare to teach. Because I've done it. I used to write out extensive outlines. And I dig into questions that no one in their right mind is even asking. And I would feel the need, because you spend all the time on those outlines, right, to go through every point. Some of you might remember it took us six months to get through the first ten chapters of Mark the first time I attempted to teach it here. And we just broke and moved on to something else. Doing the community Bible study taught me the, the, how to balance preparation. We did a chapter a week pace. I did it surfacy, quote unquote. But everybody was getting a whole lot out of it. I realized, okay, I don't need to go in exhaustive detail to where everybody's bored out of their mind in order to teach the Bible correctly. But prep preparing well, it goes a long way. And part of that also is just going over your notes, teaching it ahead of time to an empty auditorium or empty classroom, whatever it may be. To me, this is, this is my opinion here, but I think a good marker that you prepared well is that when you finally go to teach, you don't need to look at your notes. You've worked through the material, you know the material, and you just teach. You might have your questions ready to go, but you just teach. And kind of Brendan rule of thumb is, if I see that I forgot some of my notes, I go, well, it probably wasn't that important to begin with, if I had forgotten it. If it really was important, well, Lord willing, I have next Sunday, or in the next class to deal with that. So. And share what you know in love. This is what we read back in Ephesians 4 and verse 15, after all, speaking the truth in love. But, you know, I want to turn to an Old Testament example real quick of this. In Nehemiah, the 8th chapter in verse 8. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 8. This is in when they have made the pedestal or the, the podium for Ezra to read from the book of the law to all the people. And it says here in verse 8, Ezra and all of his assistants, is that they read from the, book of the law, from the book, from the law of God, explaining and giving insight, and they provided understanding of the reading. The New King James says they translated to give the sense. I picture that Ezra's up here reading, he might read a paragraph, and this is the whole assembly of Israel together, that the assistants, the attendants, are going out to the crowd, and they're asking, any questions? Do you have any questions? And there will be obviously questions, and they give the explanation. They, they gave the understanding, as the Legacy Standard Bible words it. Now, I had college professors that they would just lecture, and if you got it, great. You didn't, too bad. And I had other professors that they would see the kind of glossed over look on our faces, like, okay, you're not getting it. Let's circle back. Taking the time to make sure somebody understands is an act of love. Taking the time to make sure somebody understands fundamental truths about the Bible is an act of love. And every believer should never tire of teaching the fundamentals. This is a, I, I read one time from a brother, some advice he gave to young preachers. I've noticed older preachers, you get to a stage where you just start talking like Yoda, and it's this very vague proverbs you just start spewing out and it confuses us young guys um 
But Brother Paul Earnhardt had just mentioned to a young preacher one time, just remember, they teach first grade every year. And I had to chew on that for a little bit, and I wasn't even the guy he said it to. But the point, I think, is this. In our public schools, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, every year that same curriculum gets taught. Every year the fundamentals of reading, writing, and arithmetic gets taught. Every year algebra one gets taught. So what's the point when it comes to teaching Bible? Every year fundamentals are needed. Every season in our life, the foundations need to be checked. We should not tire of hearing those old truths. Because that's where, we, that's where we build our faith on. And I've said before, I love teaching new converts. Because one, they have no filter. <laughs> they have a question, they're going to ask you the question. Um, adult class, sometimes we get a little bit scared. Okay? I know. Um, but the chance to be able to share this knowledge again and again and again and do it in a loving manner to take the time to make sure they get it. That, that's one of the most important things in teaching is never forget what the, what the goal is and, and the attitude we need to have in it. So, appreciate your attention tonight. Uh, we're not done yet, but this next slide should be pr fairly quick. So I appreciate you listening. So some practical tips for teaching, and this has kind of been said indirectly, but I'm going to camp on it for just a moment. One of the most important practical tips on any teaching, private, publicly, whatever it is, even with children, remember that teaching is a privilege, not a right. It's a privilege, not a right. It's a privilege that is earned through good character and diligence in your own faith. It's earned through the embodiment of the teaching. Parents earn it with their children because they have cared for them, they provide for them, they've given them wisdom and insight. And kids up until a certain age don't really question their parents. I didn't ask to teach my first class. I didn't. I was approached. We'd like you to do this. We think it'd be good for you. You have to earn this right to speak. I never think I am entitled to the right to stand before you all week after week, year after year, to share with you my studies in the scriptures. It's a great privilege and a humbling experience that I have week after week that I get to do this. And if anyone, ha if anyone owes anyone anything, it's me owing the congregation here that I get to be supported in doing that. But I've seen teachers, I've seen preachers who have this completely backwards and they believe it is their right for people to sit there and listen to them. And that mindset shows up in the teaching to where it's not edifying, it's dogmatic, it's cantankerous and boisterous, it's not loving. Secondly, and this is important too, good Bible teaching starts with good Bible reading and studying. I think I've overlooked this too in my own life, but good Bible teaching is just good Bible reading. Can you read and understand the text and then tell what you've learned to somebody else? You know, there's a reason why I, I think we have in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 15 here, the wording of the newer translations has it with, uh, with diligence here. The old King James said study, but... The point holds true. He says here in the 15th verse of 2 Timothy chapter 2, be diligent to present yourself to prove to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Being diligent. I'm saving a practical point at the end here. But if we approached our Bible study with not the goal to simply learn more, okay, that, that, that's a decent goal, by the way, but, but if we approached it with, I'm studying this so I can explain it to somebody else, I think we would all see a, a, a really big change in how we study the Bible. 
of what we're going to be looking up and what we're going to be, how we take our notes of how we define certain words. Because it's one thing for me to read something and, and I think I understand it. It's another thing for me to actually then think through my words and think through what I think I know and be able to articulate that in a way that it's understandable to somebody else. Now, there's a reason why I think Paul asked some Christians one time, pray for me also. He said, not for opportunities, not for baptisms. He said, he said pray for me also that I would have, that I would speak as I ought to so I can clearly communicate the will of God. If an apostle asks for that kind of wisdom, we need that kind of wisdom. Also, reread and restudy before you teach each class. Um, I do not, if I'm teaching the gospel to somebody, I prep for that. I don't rely simply because I know Mark 16, 16, or you know, John 8, or Luke 13, 3. I, I, you know, I got those pocket verses, okay? I still restudy that. And this goes back up to a point we made a little while ago. It's because each person I study with is different. They are. No, no two people are alike, which means no two people have the same starting point. This lady I'm staying with right now on Tuesdays, her starting point was she knows nothing about the Old Testament, Mike, and that's what she wanted to study. I'm like, okay. And I'm thinking, that's good, but you're not saved. So how do I work that? Well, I came up with it. We can still do our Old Testament survey, but we're just going to hit God's faithfulness on the seed promise and the coming of Jesus every chance we can get. And so through that whole Old Testament survey, we are laying the foundation. We're talking about Jesus, what he did, what he offers. And now we're in Gospel of Matthew, and we're hitting home these points. And because she comes from this Catholic background, I have to be more aware of maybe the illustrations I use or what points I want to hit. So when we cover the model prayer, I just point out, see, what a wonderful thing that the Bible teaches that we don't need anyone else to pray to God. That I don't need to go to anyone else to confess my sins. I don't have to bash anyone. I don't need to harp on anything. All I have to do is, here's what Jesus said. But if I'm going in with a canned study, that I'm trying to like ramrod people into, I'm going to have problems. I'm going to have problems. And lastly, here's the practical tip um, that I think will help us all in our teaching, um, publicly, privately, and even when I'm not teaching. What if I prepared for every Bible class of when we come together as if I were the one teaching? with the goal to share what I've learned. Contrary to how much I talk in Bible class, I would like it more if you all talked more. <laughs> uh, some of the best insights I've gained in my own Bible study have come from comments made when we've gathered together and we're collectively studying through a text. And this is why I'm a big proponent, too. If you don't have a Bible that you're comfortable writing in, I would suggest you get one. Uh, these Bibles are meant to be used. They're meant to be marked up. They're meant to be a tool for teaching. And we really are spoiled in this country and in the English language because we can get a Bible in whatever English we want and we can get it in whatever format we want and we can get it wide margin, super wide margin, blind, whatever it is. You, you can find the Bible to start compiling all those notes. So one of the hardest things for me to do was switch from my old Bible because it was starting to fall apart is, and I still go back to it like a comfort blanket, is because that's where all my notes are at. If I can't remember the exact passage, I'm like, well, I know it was right there after the blue highlight, but before the yellow one, if you hit orange, I've gone too far. Like, you all know what I'm talking about. I've seen some of your Bibles. But if I prepared for every Bible class, like I was going to teach it, a couple things happen. One, I'm better prepared. I know the text. I just do. Secondly, I'm better prepared to participate. Because I've done the study, and it's not so much I'm not waiting for the preacher, the Bible class teacher, to tell me what it means. 
I've discovered on my own, and now I can bring that knowledge to class and edify my brethren in that way. And thirdly, if I prepare like I'm teaching, and I need to teach, I'm prepared. It has ripple effects that is good for everybody. So I know I'm kind of kind of all over the board tonight, just kind of a smorgasbord of things on teaching. But really, going back to the beginning, teaching is as simple as one person communicating truth to another person. And it doesn't matter if you need a whole bunch of notes or you can do it just from your Bible. Each is effective. Each one has their own way. But it's something we ought to be involved in. And we saw tonight how it's, we can teach in different ways. Embodying the teaching is probably one of the most effective ways that all Christians should be doing at all times. In fact, we sing a hymn from time to time. I, I forget the name of the hymn, but there's a line in there, we are the world's Bible. Sometimes we are the only Bible that the non-believer will see. And that hymn asks a question, what if the type is crooked? And what if it's hard to see? What kind of message are we giving to people by how we're embodying the teaching? So I would encourage you all from this lesson, maybe this changed how we prep for Bible study, maybe this gives you something helpful. I pray it was helpful and practical for you in your own teaching. Um, but, you know, we don't want to close any hour without offering the invitation. You know, all of us who are Christians are Christians because somebody loved us enough and took the time to share with us the gospel. That Jesus died for my sins, was raised on the third day, and now is in heaven ready to forgive me of my sins if I will come to him in trusting, obedient faith. Jesus himself said in Mark 16, verse 16, that the one who believes in him and is baptized shall be saved. The one who does not shall be condemned. If you've done that in the past and you have sin in your life, you have the promise and assurance of 1 John 1, 9, that if you confess that sin and you pray to God, it will be forgiven of you. If we can assist you tonight, whether it be the waters of baptism, whether it be through prayer, we can pray with you, we can pray for you. But we can only help you if you come forward. Let's, let's together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.